Good morning, everyone. Can we go ahead and get started? Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here, almost bright ish and early. Uh, and thanks for those who remember the rosary, which obviously I did not. So, no pinching. It's, it's a requirement. Social distancing, no pinching. I'm Lindsay Montoya. I am the dean of the Anderson School at UNM. I've been with UNM for about a year and a half now. I came in the middle of the pandemic. And uh, one of the things that I was really excited about when I joined UNM and came to New Mexico was that I learned that Danielle Casey came right after I did. Danielle and I had the pleasure of working together with both. Arizona, when I was at Arizona State University. Uh, and as we had an opportunity to connect and we both were engaged in our respective strategic planning, we really worked on thinking about ways in which we can continue our collaboration and work to build this region. And one of the things that for, for me and my perspective on why Anderson is engaged in this, this is the third of our regional innovation joint programs that we work on together. We did one here. Uh, going back now to the beginning, to the beginning of this year, almost to September. And we, we kicked off an effort to really focus on collaboration and how we at the university can bring our skill sets to bear on economic development and contribute to supporting our economic developers and our economic development agencies and organizations. And one way we do that is through expertise, like you'll hear from today, some of our expert faculty in various areas. We also can support data analysis and projects and interns to support the work, for example, of area. And in addition, we obviously support in the production of talent. And so us listening to what our community needs and what our economic development organizations need, and what do we need to be producing to make our region more competitive? This was really a great collaboration. So I'm excited to be part of this. There'll be more to come. Um, I ask you to make sure that you Reach out to us if you have any needs. I want to just ask Rob Del Campo to raise his hand for right every fight. It's fantastic. <laughs> Rob Del Campo is the senior executive director of our corporate community engagement arm at Anderson, which really is meant to be an open door to anyone in the community that we can help that needs access to UNM. So please feel free to reach out. We're here to help and be partners in progress. And I really want to thank Danielle for her great work with area and her strategic leadership and allowing us to be a partner of this. I'll turn it over to Danielle. Thank you. Hey, good morning and happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, hey, Montoya, you're lucky we didn't go with the face paint for people that didn't wear green <laughs> idea. The, the, I suggested it and the staff turned me down for whatever weird reason. Uh, oh, it is a, it's a thrill to have everyone, everyone in here. Um, this is, a, this is a, a, a nice packed room, so I'm, I'm really excited about that. What that tells me is that the topical conversations we're having are resonating with people. They're interested in this material. We've got unbelievably smart panelists and people that are going to talk about some really, really um, great information today so we can all learn. I was, I was talking to them pre-program about how I like to do these so that this is how I learn about what I'm doing. Um, you know, just backing up a little bit, we, we did, we launched this series, and, and it even goes back further now that I think about it, about a year ago. Even more than a year ago, I mean, once we reached out to me and said, CEO, you want some interns and faculty to help you with some free research? I know you're working on strategic planning. She was very intimately involved, actually, as one of our task force members as we launched a strategic plan and, and got that done like, late last summer. And uh, I said, wait, free interns and faculty that are really smart are going to help us look at some industry data. Yeah. <laughs> so we, uh, we put together some really wonderful material. We had launched that last September. And our commitment to each other has also been that all of these conversations need to be something that are helping us build and execute our strategy going forward. So we're creating actionable items and ideas through all of this. And, and I'm excited about the topic today. When you think about our, our strategic plan, we, we did a lot of data and analysis. We learned a lot about our competitive landscape, what markets we compete against, where we are truly competitive and where we're not, or where we have work to do. And we also really hone in on target industries and whittled that down to six. When I when I got to Greater Albuquerque um, at, at the organization, there were about 12 on our website. I said, well, that's great, but we can't be all things to every industry. We have to figure out the ones that make the most sense and have the 
highest propensity to really grow our economy in a positive way and raise the quality of life for everyone in this region. So uh, renewables were one that we thought about a lot. Uh, our consultants thought about a lot. We had a lot of conversations with task force members and we realized at the end of the day, because we were trying to figure out, is it is it an asset that attracts business to our market? Because this is something that's very, very meaningful to companies as they think about um, those opportunities, or is it a growth industry? We realized it's both. Uh, and there's no reason it can't be both. So I'm excited to learn more today. And, and one of the things that we have done very strategically as well, after launching our strategic plan and doing some reorganization and making sure that our staffing and the resources that we have at area, you guys may remember it as ABD, but we're the Albuquerque Regional Economic Alliance now. As of January, I'm really excited about that. It, it says a lot about who we are and, and really clarifies it and, and what we do. Um, one of the big pieces was making sure that we were doubling down on investment on very high level strategic thinking, business intelligence, and looking at things from a sophisticated manner. So I was thrilled to be able to recently recruit our next speaker, uh, was able to bring him onto our team. It was just, you know, sometimes you just have those lucky conversations and you meet someone and you say, there's something more here. Um, I brought him out and had to meet all kinds of people and, and look at our market and, um, and was lucky enough to hire Chad Matheson. And his title is Vice President for Economic Competitiveness. So it's a new role and a new title in our organization and I'll tell you a little bit about him, and then he's going to share some data to kind of kick off the conversation today. Um, in, in his role, in his, his role that we've created is 100% devised around executing our strategic plan. And it's really leading the critical initiatives that we set forth that take a look every day at our competitive position. He's going to be watching um, all of our metrics. He's going to be watching our, our um, economic indicators. Um, and so as a champion of new approaches to economic and community development, his work complements the school, full scope of our economic strategy, no doubt. He is by far an established thought leader in economic development, and he brings a, a ton of knowledge in terms of um, economic industry identification. He's a very experienced researcher, and he's worked with economic development organizations, actually spent time in uh, Hampton Roads, Virginia, and we recruited him most recently out of the Greater Memphis Chamber of Commerce, uh, a very interesting market that actually does draw quite a few economic parallels to What's happening in Greater Albuquerque? Um, anyway, when he was there in Memphis, he successfully launched the Center for Economic Competitiveness out of the chamber. And in that capacity, he worked, worked with senior staff and business executives and co created long term job creation and talent development strategies. So he's bringing us a lot of wonderful experience and know how. He's got a bachelor's degree in economics from Old Dominion University in Norfolk, and he joined us just in February. Um, so it's been a wild ride for him. I said, you don't mind speaking on a podium about three weeks into your, into your tenure with us? And he said, absolutely no problem. So he's a proud father of two, and he is doing an Albuquerque with his wife, Megan, who had already met, I think, like 30 people before you guys even moved here, uh, and his two daughters, Phoebe and Cheyenne. So with that, Chad is going to walk you through some data. Uh, humble introductions. So it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, you all to, to begin to kind of tee up some of the data and information that we're going to talk about collectively throughout the day. Uh, certainly, a topic related to renewable energy and green technologies here within the Greater Albuquerque Metro. To kind of start the conversation, you know, we want to take a look at it from a macro sense. You know, what's the critical mass of uh, Relevant industry presence and talent here to support these industries. And when you look at it, you can actually see that the industries that complement the renewable energy sectors from a cluster perspective have significant regional presence here within the Greater Metro. Back in 2020, these industries, in aggregate, generated over 4 billion in contributions to our gross regional product. Helping to fuel some of this productivity from an industrial perspective, you can see their employment counts there. In aggregate, these industries are employing over 20,000 people here within the region. But more interestingly, is that growth rate attached to it. Over the past five years, jobs within these industries have expanded over 21%, which is a great sign of health 
and long-term sustainable growth in these industries. And helping to fuel that, of course, is our talent pipelines. The volume of graduates that our market is, is producing that align to the needs of employers that are operating in these industries. We've on average annually just about 1,200. So that kind of tees up a macro sense. And we wanted to have to understand the market by way of two dynamics, both supply and demand. And when we look at the supply side, we can uniquely look at simply job growth, right? What's going on in aggregate? But then more interestingly, what are the insights that we can glean from a deeper, a more detailed industrial perspective? So you see on the right-hand slide here, that's your in aggregate uh, job growth for the metro area over the past five years, kind of plateauing there, but still expanding even through the COVID-related contraction, important to know. And then on the left-hand side here, you see those more detailed industries. Industries for which we hold a current significant critical mass as it relates to certainly research and development that we call the degrees towards. But then also you see the emergence of production-oriented industries, manufacturing, manufacturing industries, the industries which are producing the components that are required to be simple on some of these um, renewable energy products. And then finally, the construction, the maintenance of facilities, and the maintenance of um, these products themselves. So we can begin to understand from a more detailed level where are those unique industry verticals that we can drive resources towards to deepen our specialization within renewable energies as a broad-based collective uh, sector region-wide. So that's actually what you see here. These unique industry verticals that are employing different mixes of people, different workforce compositions, but are fundamentally critical to the health of the sector, or the health of the cluster region-wide. So you can see, it's a little small, so I apologize, but the construction and installation as we saw, the industries that complement the distribution of power. You also see the production there relative to engineering technicians, machinists, assemblers, and then the research and development sectors themselves for both material sciences and other ones in the same regard. And so as we think about industries, right, we think about how they're supported by those occupations, like people that are being employed within them. But more importantly, we can look at demand, employer demand. So within job postings from regional firms, what's the density of demand for these unique occupational cohorts that are supporting these industries? And we can look at it by way of growth and the volume of that demand. And then more specifically, for the job types, for the skills, for the educational requirements that are permeating through those postings so that we're ensure that we're communicating relevant language to talent development systems and workforce development partners in that regard. Go to the next one. Uh, and it didn't make it in here, but I thought one interesting insight that was uncovered in the process of discovery to, this, to the building of this presentation was actually growth and demand for engineers and engineering technicians over the past decade. And what we found was relative to those two occupational cohorts indexed to 2011, growth and demand has expanded for engineers and engineering techs by 120% regionally. That outpaces the national growth of 86% in the same time period. So when we think about town supply, town demand, it's important for us to align language, pipelines to support the industries to enhance that growth forward. Of course. What you see here is a construct of economic competitiveness 
for industry transcends more variables than just count at the end of the day. And so a primary component of the work that I will be responsible for on you all's behalf and in the L and area as an organization, we're beginning to understand at deeper levels the key enablers that make our environment more competitive for investment within this specific industry. So you can certainly see people down there, talent. You have to have talent to support the industries that we intend to receive investments in, in the context of the world. We also have to have the places, the sites, the buildings, and the real estate, so that these firms have a place to land when they choose greater Albuquerque for their investment. And then we have to have the infrastructure to support the operations, whether that's demand heavy manufacturing establishment or a broadband heavy technology center. The final two, ensuring that we have the right tools in our toolbox to offset and cost disadvantages for, price, for private industries, and then working to collectively as ambassadors of the region on the local environment to ensure that we're improving job progression pathways and business time, bringing those variables to industries that will ultimately invest in the market. So that ends my presentation for teeing up the conversation today. But I just want to thank you all for having me, one, located here in Greater Albuquerque, and two, having me here on stage this morning. I'm excited to meet each and every one of you long term and for the work that we'll all be doing. So now it's my pleasure uh, to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Gabriel Sanchez. He's a professor of political science and the founding Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Endowed Chair in Health Policy at the University of New Mexico. Dr. Sanchez is also the director of UNM Center for Social Policy and the Rubenstein Fellow of Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution. Dr. Sanchez is a nationally recognized expert in survey research and the utilization of rigorous research to inform public policy decisions at the federal, state, so join me now in welcoming Dr. Sanchez. Well, thank you very much for that warm introduction. Welcome to New Mexico. We're lucky to have you, so I appreciate you being here. Uh, thank you, Anderson School area, for, for having me on this uh, panel and conversation. My job is to provide some perspective on, on where the population across the state of New Mexico is at as we think about the transition, and particularly in terms of workforce. Um, so if, uh, if I can, this project was on behalf of the Department of Workforce Solutions. And I'll tell all of you, particularly the folks on Zoom, uh, that if you want to see the full report, I've got a link on the last slide, pretty lengthy, uh, but tons of information in there that I want to have an opportunity to, to dig into. So I advise all of you that want to see more, uh, particularly in terms of the higher education analysis that I won't talk much about today, um, I'll, I'll make sure that you have that link if you need it. So I won't talk a lot about the design or, or methodology, but in essence, we started with an expansive landscape analysis. Basically talked to folks in other states that are a little bit further along in the transition than we are, pulled any national data that we could get on workforce, and a lot of those insights inform the questionnaires that we utilized for our survey and for our analysis. And some of the things that we learned from the landscape analysis are, number one, uh, that when we think about the population demographics, it doesn't look a lot like New Mexico's workforce. Uh, we think about it in terms of race, it's predominantly white in terms of the workforce, especially as you get into the higher echelons of positions, uh, predominantly male and lacks racial and ethnic diversity across essentially all aspects of the workforce. So when I share some information from you from the public's perspective of what their fears, concerns, goals are, and thinking about this transition, you're going to hear a lot of this based on what they've seen from other states with national data. Uh, the primary uh, data that I'll present for you today comes from the statewide survey and a ton of interviews and focus groups that we did. You see, the timeline was right in the heart of COVID. Uh, 
Uh, so I'll say that without the help of a lot of our colleagues, uh, the Power Core Coalition New Mexico team, which is a composition of organizations that operate across the state, that partnered with us early on, recognizing all of our plans to do big in-person events across the state obviously couldn't happen. So we shifted pretty radically to do everything uh, that you see here, not having any personal touch. So it's pretty impressive. I think we talked mm -hmm. to somewhere like 2,500 people in a relatively mm -hmm. short period of time in, in the new world. Next slide, please. So overview of, of what I'll talk about in the first phase of my time with you today is when we think about jobs and the potential, right, our landscape analysis show huge potential for New Mexico, and particularly folks at lower levels of education attain. In fact, in thinking about the percentage of increase in wages, people with only a high school degree are expected in New Mexico to see the greatest increase in the wages moving from other sectors, particularly in energy. But the population knows none of this. In essence, the first thing we started talking to people about, whether it was a survey or focus groups, was do you know anything about the Energy Transition Act? Do you know anything about how we're moving uh, towards these jobs? And very, very little saturation of people, basic information across the population, even among folks that are already thinking about moving into the sector. And so a big part of this is going to be basic, information outreach is needed. And particularly when we think about perceptions about quality and availability of jobs, a lot of misinformation is out there. And I'll, I'll show you some direct examples. So first thing I'm gonna suggest is large scale outreach to the population and particularly micro focus on the sectors of the population that we think we would be trying to persuade to move into the sector or get trained uh, ahead of right this transition. Give you some semblance of what we saw out of survey research, we asked folks essentially after giving them some really basic information about this transition, where do they think the priorities should be in terms of their perceived or projected right, benefits for themselves as families as well as for the state. And you see what I want to highlight is, is jobs, 60% were key. And across the focus groups that we spent time talking to people about, once they heard a little bit about it, more so than just about any other potential benefit, even as consumers, potential savings associated with moving towards clean energy. The conversation that folks wanted to keep hearing more about was jobs, um, particularly once they got some basic information from the landscape analysis on what the projected job growth would look like for New Mexico and the quality of those jobs. Uh, but the misinformation is, is key. Uh, folks were telling us, even that we're already getting certificates to be trained in these areas, that they've heard they're going to have to move to other states because New Mexico is not quite ready to hire folks. We also heard a lot of folks tell us, hey, I'm about to graduate. Uh, but I understand I'm going to have to, in order to stay here, work in oil and gas because New Mexico doesn't have the same quality of jobs. And these are from folks that have spent two to four years already being trained in this industry. So we know we've got some work to do. But you see, after basic information, huge, huge positive attitudes about this transition. Whether we think about the larger economic development um, associated with clean energy industry that you see is super high in terms of projected or perceived importance across the population, or uh, the environmental benefits. So population very ready, but we have to meet them where they're at with basic information. When we ask folks in depth, what are their concerns after they've heard a little bit about this? Not surprising to those of us that are from the state of New Mexico, huge concerns about all of these jobs being really in the urban areas, Santa Fe and Albuquerque, uh, huge concerns that these jobs will all be for PhD level folks, engineers only, not for the lower levels of, of our overall workforce across the state. Thinking about also in the context of, of, of the state's heavy reliance on oil and gas, what concerns that will have not only for that industry, but all the spillover industries. In fact, we held a number of focus groups of small business owners in the San Juan area. And their biggest concerns was the gap between when all of this infrastructure in New Mexico takes hold and the time all the oil and gas starts to wind down. All those mom and pop type businesses rely heavily on that industry. So they were extremely concerned about Upside is, especially in the focus groups, once we were able to overcome some of these concerns, telling folks directly, look, look at the national data. Almost all of the new jobs that we know are going to come to New Mexico are going to be in rural counties and state, particularly when you think about wind. Right? All those jobs are going to be in, in rural parts of the state. Folks' concerns go down considerably. Their excitement on hearing more goes up considerably. But we have to provide that basic information because what folks are concerned about, right, unfortunately comes out a lot of the landscape analysis that we did, particularly in terms of thinking about diversity. Give you a couple of examples of things that we heard from, from leaders, whether they were community leaders or nonprofit leaders, same conversation kept coming up. Uh, this one on the top, 
basically is the lack of diversity. I would say I wasn't aware of, of how non-diverse the clean energy sector is, especially given that it's touted so much of people in my network, extreme progressives that are pushing heavily in this direction. Many of them did not know what to look at, whether it's state of California, Hawaii, places a little further along, or national data on clean energy. Again, very, very limited in terms of specifically racial and ethnic diversity. So it's not surprising that a lot of folks that are already pushing in the direction of moving towards clean energy are worried about the workforce not looking like New Mexicans. And in fact, one of the things we heard over and over again is, Professor Sanchez, how do we make sure that we prepare New Mexico's workforce now so they can take advantage of those jobs and we don't have to rely on outsourcing a lot of these jobs to folks from other states that might already have the credentials? Right? So that, you can imagine, widespread concern across the population on that. And again, thinking about uh, economic opportunities that might be available, right, that are at a higher level of compensation and available to people here. Um, again, you're seeing folks that are hungry to help us with that effort of getting information out. We just have to provide the basis. One of the things that we want to do is demonstrate to the state of New Mexico how relatively easy it is to put out some of this outreach. So we built a ton of these very basic infographics based on what we've seen in the national research to include in our report. This is just one of those that, again, the idea is this doesn't have to be complex, right? We're not asking folks to read the 100 page report that our team puts together. Give them snippets to get them excited about hearing more, whether it's the overall growth of the industry, the economic development data that you heard just before my presentation, or specifically thinking about wind and the jobs that will be created. I love wind as an example because almost exclusively those jobs are going to be in rural counties, right? By definition of where they have to be structured in the state. When we ask folks their policy priorities, this is just a snippet of a ton of, of things that we asked uh, the population in terms of whether they thought it would be important or whether they thought this would be something the state should prioritize. You see widespread importance across a range of different opportunities, including looking at our procurement policies across the state and all these industries to advantage local businesses and local workforce and any procurement contracts that might be presented in this area, uh, providing folks specifically in rural areas with concentrated training and making sure folks in rural areas have advantage opportunities to be able to participate in a lot of those programs. I will tell you on that one, one of the benefits of the analysis that we did of our higher education institutions, and that was Dana Bell and her team that operate out of my center. What they found is, fortunately, we already have the infrastructure in place, particularly our junior college two-year institutions have everything you need to prepare the workforce. Unfortunately, right, those institutions are spread out across different areas of the state. And so this concern of rural folks potentially being left out of the equation is a real one, right? So thinking about prioritizing training, especially now that we've all gotten much, much better at doing technologically based training, I think we can definitely meet folks where they're at and not require them to think about moving there, their families, to Albuquerque to take advantage of things that we have available in the uh, But you see that the main take home message is whether we're thinking about advantaging the population in ways in terms of policy, the population, and particularly the electorate, the voting population is with us on just about anything that we want to pursue to, again, make sure that New Mexicans have opportunities for the job. One of the things that, that jumped out of us, especially when we started to talk about people in the industry already here in New Mexico, is the need for apprenticeships and internships. Um, I conducted this focus group myself of solar energy panels. These are the folks that come out and install panels on the roofs, so this is the roof. Talk to a lot of the foremen. Uh, that, that operate already in New Mexico. A couple of upsides. They said the good news is they're already seeing that when they recruit folks from other construction-oriented entities, the job growth and the amount of, of salary increases are exponential. A lot of these folks, that's the reason why they made this transition and they're trying to recruit others. But the thing that jumped out at me was these folks were very clear on the need to diversify in terms of age. And you see in the quote stressing how difficult it is not only to find young workforce in this area, but to keep and sustain them. And I, I, you know, talking to these people on the job as they were doing their thing was clear to me, right? Folks might come out relatively young and experienced in terms of the certificates and the training, but you see the quote, doing this on top of a roof in the wind and weather, much different than in a controlled environment in the classroom. And you see the quote, they, they find people sometimes don't even last three days on the job after training. So we need to get out ahead of that, provide folks that are getting the certificates on the job training so they know what they're getting into, Hopefully they stick with it for the long haul. 
We also talked to a lot of folks already being trained in these programs, and I won't elaborate up on these quotes for you. But again, I think the main take home message is even folks that are already trying to be people that we want to try to persuade to move into these industries or stay in New Mexico have a lot of built in misinformation behind that. And one of the things that we were consistently proposed that are already close to graduation is a perception that they're going to have to leave New Mexico because the jobs aren't here and available for them now, or when they are created, they're not going to pay as well as oil and gas. There's some truth to some of that, as you might imagine. But I think the upside is we have time before the infrastructure is wrapped up to help with misinformation and make sure that folks that are already here and want to stay here in New Mexico will do so. Final couple of slides. I always like to leave people with some optimism because unfortunately a lot of what we learned wasn't the most uh, sunshiny in terms of thinking about how things will look in New Mexico long term. When we ask folks at the very end of interviews or the survey, after you've heard all of this, are you interested and volunteering your time to learn more about this and potentially participate in training programs to either retrain yourself for these jobs or to get the, the training in the programs. And you see 42% and much higher among under age of 30 and folks that are in college right now, I think those numbers jump up to about 70%. High level of interest, especially when folks get just some basic information about what's available and what's projected across the state. But, and then finally, when we ask folks, are there any obstacles? that might get in the way of you being able to take advantage of training opportunities. A whole gamut of things that emerge that are consistent with a lot of other survey work we've done for workforce solutions on the unemployed segment of the population right now. Everything ranging from the need to have childcare, to be able to participate, the need to figure out how they're going to retrain themselves when they're already in full-time jobs but want to make moves into this industry. A range of things from uh, potentially being able to do things virtually because they live in rural areas as well as folks that are suffering from digital divide and wanted the opposite. So the take home message is the population wants to be retrained. They're very hungry about these jobs, but we're going to have to observe and identify what some of these obstacles are on the front end and all work together to make sure we remove those as we move forward with ramped up infrastructure. So that concludes my time. Again, full weight to the full report. It's long, us academics like to pack in a ton of figures and tables, but hopefully those of you that want more information will be able to get it there. Um, you can obviously email me as well if you'd like any further conversation. Again, thanks for having me. Hopefully this helps tee up uh, the wonderful panel that I know you all are set to hear. Thank you. It's super engaged. I love it. Um, wonderful, wonderful data and very, very interesting. Um, all right, so I get this super easy. This is what I love. You get great moderators and panelists. You guys, you guys do all the work, right? So, uh, so I'm I'm really thrilled today because of wonderful relationships that that we have with folks at Senator Heinrich's office and their team. Uh, literally, this came about with a regular coffee meeting we generally have, and I was sharing with some of the staff there what we're working on in different industries and upcoming programs. And they said, "Wow, we've got somebody who's working on the senator's behalf and doing some very cool things." Uh, let's see if he can help you out. So today we have Mike Sullivan. He is the senior advisor to Martin Heinrich, Senator Heinrich, and he works primarily on issues related to public lands and renewable energy. He has previously worked for U.S. Senators Russ Feingold of Wisconsin and John Tester from Montana. And uh, while not working in politics, he's lived in some of the most remote and beautiful places in America, including the Boundary Waters Canoe Area in Minnesota. Oh my you give me some tips, right? Uh, and the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in Alaska, I'm jealous. Uh, during Senator Heinrich's first term, Mike managed the Senator's field representatives in five offices across New Mexico, and he helped create the Bay Caldera National Preserve, the Rio Grande del Norte, and Oregon Mountains Desert Peak. This is a lot of words. Desert Peaks National Monuments, all places I need to visit, by the way when we're less busy. I don't know when that's going to be. And White Sands National Park. So Mike's going to come up and join us, and I'm going to give him, please come on up, everybody. I'm going to give him the uh, opportunity, privilege, and the job of then introducing all of the panelists, having them self-introduce, and really holding a wonderful conversation. And, and by the way, on the link on that, on the last presentation, know that we're going to send all this material out to everybody post-program. We're recording today as well, because I know you're going to you're going to think of 50 people that need to watch this as well. So with that, Mike, panelists, come take it away.
Well, thank you, Jenny. It's a, it's a real honor to be here. Uh, always difficult to follow Dr. Sanchez because they all spark some amazing ideas. So thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I have uh, uh, the joy of introducing an expert panel here. Uh, and we will have the opportunity to go to a few questions, then we'll take some questions uh, from you all. Uh, first up, uh, Jennifer Trasso. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Uh, Jennifer is responsible for leading the Human Resources Department at Array Technologies. Uh, if you don't know, Array is one of New Mexico's brightest stars when it comes to the economy. Has been for, for many years, uh, and I'd say uh, globally as well. So, Jennifer, can you please tell us a bit about what Array Technologies does? Yeah, hi. Um, nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, Jen Tarasso, um, I am with Array Technologies. I've been with Array for about three years. Um, prior to that, I spent about 20 years with Honeywell and uh, different HR functions. Um, and it was a real thrill to be able to join Array Technologies. Um, as mentioned, Array has been around for a long time but we've seen significant growth just in the past few years um, and the growth just con just continues. So we were fortunate enough to um, do a successful IPO in October of 2020 uh, through COVID. Um, and then most recently in January, um, we closed on a significant acquisition with STI New Orleans, uh, headquartered out of Spain. So that significantly expanded our growth footprint. Um, and just uh, very excited about the opportunity to have such a, a large presence in the renewable energy space and to um, focus on sustainability. So, thanks. Next up, we have Dr. Ganesh Balakrishnan, who has generously allowed me to the authorities. Gunny is a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering in Mexico. He's also the new director at the Mexico EPSCO. That is a uh, National Science Foundation funded program designed to stimulate competitive research by strengthening uh, STEM kind of capacity uh, in, in state or federal parks. Right. Do you take over and tell us a bit about what score does? Sure, thank you. Um, so, yeah, thank you all for coming here. It's great to see people in person and not through a screen. Um, so, so, yeah, EPSCOR, there were great presentations made this morning. And EPSCOR is, is in response to the problems that we face. Uh, we view ourselves as an organization that spans the entire state. Um, a state is designated as EPSCOR because it receives less than 0.75% of the entire National Science Foundation funding. So there are roughly 20 states that at any given time are classified as EPSCOR. As a part of that, we get something called a track one fund where we strategically identify the technology that we want to invest in, in, in this time around is uh, smart grids. And um, we received up to $24 million to work with all institutions in the state. And this includes two years, four years, PhD granting universities, um, community colleges, uh, museums, um, everyone. And, and we create a program that, that's very inclusive and we try to act as a catalyst for that particular technology. Um, so in the past, we've done that technology, we've done water-based problems, we've done energy, now it's um, a smart grid, and in the near future, we'll also be transitioning to additive manufacturing. Great. Next up, we have Jim Dejardin. The, uh, Jim was born and raised in Chicago and earned a, a BS in marketing at the University of Illinois at Chicago. His professional career is in positions in the desktop computer industry, telecommunications, real estate, and at the U.S. Embassy in the Department of State. Since 2008, he's been here in Albuquerque working in a variety of positions in the solar industry, and he is currently the executive director of the Renewable Energy Industries Association. When Jim, please tell us. What the uh, Renewable Energy Industry Association uh, does for the uh, public policy. Sure, thank you, Mike, and good morning, everyone. Great to be here. Um, Renewable Energy Industries Association, that's what we go by the acronym RIA, so easy to say. We trace our roots back to 2004, and as I jokingly tell people, if you were in the solar industry in 2040, you weren't in it to make big bucks. You, you were in it because you believed in the promise of renewable energy. 
Uh, right now, we have about 45 members. Our members include local solar integrators, developers, manufacturers, distributors. Uh, we have a major credit union that's a member and a community college that's about a couple miles away. It's also a member. And we engage in policies that are favorable to the renewable energy industry. And our specific focus is distributed energy resources, known as DEI. That's a little bit about what we do. Great. Thanks, Dad. So uh, my first question will be for each of you. Uh, and it is, what gets you most excited about renewable energy and green technology? I'm going to go first, actually. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm pretty excited about uh, a, a recent development here. Uh, how many of you have been to Corona in Mexico? That's that's pretty good. If you haven't been there uh, or been there recently, you want to be excited about the clean energy economy in Mexico. Head down there uh, right now. As just done the last week, there are 377 wind turbines. Uh, there's a new transmission line. Uh, the West Spirit Line is the second largest wind farm in the United States. Uh, and it's currently operating. I got to meet with uh, ranchers who uh, told me that these wind turbines are allowing them to thrive, not just to survive them. I talked to uh, wind tech engineers who were staying in the area uh, because there were jobs there now. Uh, and I was talking to uh, gas station owners whose business is, is, is doing great down in, in this little town. And it's pretty exciting stuff. And hopefully, just uh, 25% of what will eventually become the largest wind farm in the Western Hemisphere. So that is what I'm excited about. Jen, can you please uh, tell us what you're most excited about with the group that you have? I think just our ability to be uh, energy independent as a country and to um, the sustainability piece, right? Just to um, help clean up the entire world, right? So I think that's pretty exciting. Yeah, I mean, it, it is the it is the area of research and and innovation to be in right now. You can see all the curves starting to look like the way computation looked like in the nineties or, or the eighties and the nineties. Um, so you you have generation uh, more efficient solar cells, better wind turbines, huge wind turbines. Um, you also are starting to see much better storage capacities. You know, people are trying several different things, grid level storage, uh, home level storage. Um, now you pair that with, with uh, the ability to move energy around and electricity is far easier and, and less environmentally dangerous to move around than uh, petroleum. Um, so, so now you can have like a grid level, you know, movement of energy between states, between regions. You could have uh, home-based storage. You could so 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 the it, it's ripe for for innovation to step in and and generate a massive uh, economy for us. Um, we should also keep in mind that given all the socio geopolitical issues, that you can see a trend where the concentration of energy uh, of petroleum with a few people leads to despotic governments, right? And distributing energy like you can with renewable energy, where uh, someone, a farmer, can farming them could produce uh, energy by themselves, or what someone in Albuquerque could produce their own, their own energy. But at the same time, perhaps a co-op of people could produce their own energy, like, like a group of people. Or you could do it at a state level. Or you could be in sub-Saharan areas exporting energy to Europe. So it scales beautifully. It scales from a little shack to a whole continent. And I think that that decentralization of energy will lead to a much better world. It's not just a technological problem, it's also a socioeconomic problem that, that we could solve by switching over to renewable energy economy. Thank you, Ganesh. I'd like how you said the decentralization, that, that really feeds into part of what I'm really excited about. Um, a couple of things that really do uh, get me excited is, first of all, we're in a dis disruptive industry. And to me, that's really exciting. There's a, there's a whole lot of things we can do. And as my reference, I was in the desktop computer industry and made that, and that was disruptive. Um, I was in telecommunications, I was involved in cell phones, which are continuing to disrupt. But I think this is the big one. And so 
that's uh, just really exciting to me. Um, but also, there's a lot of opportunities there, opportunities for young people to get into something that's new and exciting. And then finally, it's really great that we're part of, I think, solving one of the biggest problems in the world, which is climate change. Great, thank you. Both of uh, you mentioned distributed energy resources. So that includes residential or commercial solar, uh, and soon community solar, the, the legislature has passed. Uh, these are becoming more and more prevalent as forms of uh, electrical generation in the state. Uh, what role do you see uh, distributed energy having in the clean energy economy, and specifically, uh, Jim, I'll pick up you, uh, you can talk a little bit about how do you see community solar playing out in the next uh, years? Well, first of all, we have uh, the grid right now, the design of it is about 100 years old. So most of the things that we use now were not designed 100 years ago. It served as well. Uh, the national grid has been referred to as the, one of the largest machines in the world, but I think it needs to be updated. We need to look, first of all, at the design of the grid. Right now, it's basically a one-way uh, machine. So you have big generators, they send electricity down the transmission lines, they then go through distribution lines to our homes, to our businesses. And I think the grid of the future, just sort of like how IT is today, it's going to be two-way. And it's going to involve big, like what we have right now with big generators, um, but it's also going to involve medium-sized generators. I think that's where community solar fits in, because those are placed on the distribution line. And then it's going to involve small generators, the kind that I have in my home, and probably many of you in the audience might have in your homes and your businesses. But we need to look at the overall design so we can optimize it so that it, it works best for the whole community, you know, the whole country, the whole world, basically. So I think there's a lot of um, potential there to look at how all those pieces will work together in the optimal. Uh, can I ask you, could, you, could one define community solar for participants that may not be aware of? Um, so community solar would be perhaps you know your development. There's a, there's a, there are some developments outside Denver, the border, um, where you could you could be part of a community where um, the, the generation storage um, is is done within that community. So it, you know the community is self-sufficient. Uh, it also extends to concepts beyond solar. Uh, it extends to food and and other issues as well that, that the community could be part of. But it, at the same time, it's also connected to the grid in some cases that you do have in case of, of, a, of a prolonged period of not having sunlight, you can, the grid can step in and help you out. But at the same time, it gives communities self-reliance. It, it, it also helps with um, a sort of a feeling of, for lack of better word, community. Yeah. <laughs> So if, if someone, like, I have a house where I can't put solar panels on that, I would, I'd be able to buy into a, a, a solar, small solar field along with my neighbors and participate in distributed energy in that way. Certainly, and, and you have co-ops, so that you could, you could have, you know, you could buy energy, and, and the ability to trade energy like that is also critical. Yeah. Right, so if you can, if you can select perhaps five or six options, I know that PNM had a blue sky option for several years, and, and I used to be part of that. Uh, I think it's, it's over a decade, but they, they would send you some, you could opt for renewable energy. But co ops are physically there. You can actually walk over, see the solar panels generating the power, and, and you could be part of that. So, so yes, I mean, in, in many places, we are just blessed with rooftops and sunshine. Not everyone is so. So in many places, that's a far better option than just having, you know, you're in an apartment. So another option for people that want to participate. Yeah. So, um, Jennifer, uh, uh, Jen, I have a, a question uh, for you about workforce issues. So at, at the national level, you know, in the greater Albuquerque region, we really need to prove ourselves as a, a location of choice for the next generation of industry investment. Uh, what do you see on the horizon for renewable energy? And how can we begin to collaborate today to make sure we're positioning ourselves? Uh, yeah. 
I think a lot of it uh, was just a bit earlier you know, by you know, Dr. Sanchez. Um, to try to engage the younger workforce um, to get involved in schools, have partnerships with engineering, technology schools, um, and to be able to give people a path, a career path, and to be able to accommodate all different levels, right? So your engineers, PhDs, and then your technology folks, and the individuals who maybe have a, a high school degree or, or less, right? Um, and to be able to uh, accommodate those, to be able to create an environment where people are going to want to come here, right? And, uh, good places to raise families and things like that. So I think if we can provide many of those things that will attract um, talked about rural areas. I spent the last couple of days at a solar farm in the middle of nowhere in Illinois, in Lena, Illinois, and just what um, that generated for that community, similar to the example that you uh, mentioned. Um, I think being able to provide on-the-job training for your people, right, especially in these new, in this new industry in the renewable space, some of the things we're looking at, right, it's partnerships with different universities, how do we engage early, right, create internships and, and room the talents so that they'll want to join us full time and continue to stay with us, um, provide continuing education, right, education reimbursement. So once you join, we help develop, uh, just uh, foster those relationships. So I think those are some of the things. Well, that's an excellent segue to, to Gunny's role at uh, the M-Score. And Gunny, I, I wonder if you might speak a little bit on, on that as well, about you know, the, these partnerships that we have uh, that really do build that workforce. Um, and that's and then I'd be curious about your, your thoughts. They also mentioned, uh, well, I'll come back. Gunny, why don't you go back? Okay. No, so... So, so like uh, Professor Sanchez said, it, it's it's a massive state, and, and our population is distributed quite a bit. Uh, we do have certain centers of, of large population, Santa Fe, Albuquerque, uh, Las Cruces. But beyond that, there's a lot of people living in, in areas that are considered rural. And I think that the opportunity opportunities just fly over them because they, they just don't have access to, to training, state-of-the-art training, state-of-the-art jobs. Um, and the renewable energy industry is one where the, the rural areas do actually benefit from technological advances, from new technology, installation, maintenance, things like that. So as, as EPSCOR, we feel that we would like to use the vast number of institutions that New Mexico has, and New Mexico has quite a few institutions for its population size. Um, almost we, the last we counted, we engaged 20 to 25 institutions. And the idea is to get um, research and training going in, in all of these institutions so that they can then produce students who can immediately be for lack of better phrasing, plugged into the renewable energy market, right? And, and they can get a job immediately. It, it also goes to show the, the government's interest in, in seeing these things done, and that is the spirit in which Export was created. Um, and it, in, in certain aspects, the right infusion of funding from the federal and state government can be a huge catalyst in, in getting things going. And I think that export is an example of something like that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim, uh, working on that, uh, you know, EPSCOR is an example of an organization that's, that's doing that threat, that, that's building the, the workforce for the, the companies that, that you represent. Uh, do you feel that there's enough of that in New Mexico? Does there need to be more? Are there any changes uh, to that model? Well, that's, that's a good question. And I, I don't really have an answer to that other than I know that there's a disconnect there. And I think there's a disconnect between the training and the, the um, education being provided and the, and the jobs that are available. And um, I don't, 
really have an answer for that, but I think we like I need to go some more time. <laughs> and and uh, I, I just think there needs to be more collaboration on that. Um, and there, and there is definitely need to be So aside from the, the workforce challenges that we face, um, what do each of you see as the greater Albuquerque region's most significant challenges to growth in the industry? Sorry. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Well, Going back to that 100-year-old system that we have in place, we have rules that are also very old. And so we need to update that for what's happening today. So I'll give you an example. Um, the current interconnection rules and manual that basically dictates how we connect solar systems, big, small, medium, go back to 2008. And anyone who knows anything about the solar industry knows that 2008 is a real long time ago. And so right now we're in the process of updating those at the Public Regulation Commission, but it's not been smooth sailing. And that process has been going on for about a year now. Uh, I think we're going to get some good outcomes out of that. But we need a lot of updating there. We need updating in our permitting. And I was reading about the uh, project in Corona, but I also read that it took 10 years to get that done. We can't wait 10 years to get projects like that done. We gotta build them quicker. And so I think we need to look at these things like how can we move quicker, better uh, to get these important things. Before we move on to Gunny, Jim, do you see the change that is uh, coming at the, the Public Regulation uh, Commission who regulates our uh, utility industry in Mexico moving from a, uh, an elected commission to an appointed commission? Uh, in 2023. Do you see that uh, as, uh, how do you think that will affect this year? Well, I think it's going to affect a lot of things between now and December 31st, 2022, because I think the existing commission has a lot of plate that they want to get a lot, they want to finish that up, finish up their work, which is understandable, which is kind of a legacy thing there, but also they want to have a smooth handoff. Um, our organization is engaged in uh, dockets right now at the PRC, so that gives you an idea. Dockets for those who don't know that's such a proceeding. And there might be a sixth, which is, which is good modernization, which is obviously very important. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot that's going to be happening at the Public Regulation Commission in the next few months. Uh, hopefully, what comes out of that will be good. Um, we're certainly uh, heavily engaged on that. But I do think overall that um, having an appointed commission is a good idea. Gunny, what do you see as uh, Albuquerque's most significant challenges to both of them? Um, I, I actually think that we are very siloed. We have everything we need to succeed. It's just siloed. So there's a massive amount of intellectual property in town. Uh, there's a massive number of scientists in town. Um, there are students, there are uh, high quality students coming out of all the universities, particularly at, at uh, UNM, CNM. Um, city. Um, so, so we have we have everything we need to succeed. I think we need to figure out a way to connect these things. So, for example, just an anecdotal example would be, um, you know, the, if, if we can get abundant uh, electricity from solar panels, then it's an ideal place for data centers. But data centers consume a lot of water for cooling and. This is an issue. So Microsoft is burying some of its data centers off the coast of Norway under the water to move it. But the flip side of it, you could also design far better uh, air-based cooling systems as well. And Sandia National Labs is involved in it and has a lot of IP uh, in this area as well. So I, I think that a, a culture of entrepreneurship, right? So if you go to University of California, Santa Barbara, Every kid graduating there wants to start the next big dot-com company, right? And I think that that culture needs to come to us. Uh, and the one last thing I'll say is that what we solve in Albuquerque will actually impact things across the globe. When you solve a problem in renewable energy, you can help a poor country jump several generations of technologies. And this has been seen in other industries such as cell phones, where some several sub-Saharan countries in the Indian subcontinent just completely bypassed laying copper wires for telephones and went straight to cell phones. 
and we can help the entire world with the innovation that we generate here. So I think we need to have events like this, talk better, have flow of IP. Um, so I, I just think it's a flow issue. That's important. <laughs> Jen, say question. Yeah, I would just kind of piggy up, piggyback on that. And I think it's just about awareness, right? Getting out there, breaking down those silos and, and you know, increasing awareness. Um, I'll tell you, many of the folks that we hire are just extremely passionate about sustainability, right? And they just don't know where to go to contribute to that. So I think if we can get awareness out again in schools, uh, universities, and those types of things, um, the younger generation is really. Uh, Energetic about that, and so we can just continue to raise awareness. I think we saw it in the survey data today as well. So, absolutely. Uh, at this point, I'd like to turn over the, the questions to the to the audience. So, if anybody has any questions for us, yeah. well, I'm curious. Does, do most states have PRCs, and are they as bad as ours? Um, <laughs> they have the equivalent. Um, so, like in Colorado, it's a public utility commission. The public regulation commission here regulates more than utilities. And so, although they took some stuff off the plate, um, the, the, they, they have a lot of stuff to do. And so, I think they, they do the best they can. There have been suggestions that they're under resourced or understaffed. So that, that could also be an issue. Um, and a lot of these issues are very complex. And, and also, I will, maybe this is my own personal opinion, but the utilities have a vested interest in kind of doing business as usual. So there is a, a reluctance to move quickly to change. And so that's um, part of the challenge. So the, the question was, do other states have a, a PRC? Uh, okay. Well, and the uh, answer is yes. They, every state has, to, has something more. Anybody else want to tackle that one? All right. <laughs> uh, we'll stick in, in the front of all the questions. Uh, Jen, to follow up on your recent statement, I mean, obviously people who are enthusiastic about sustainability are in the market. They're excited to be working there. But as we see things grow, we're going to need to win over some of the people who may be kind of equivocal or anti, even right in some cases. So, specifically thinking about array technologies, what are you guys doing or considering doing to make those changes? You know, like you said, obviously working with schools and that sort of thing, but but what are what are the strategies really look like in your corporate environment? Did folks hear the question? I'm just going to put it in. Yeah, no, that's. Good. Um, so, just to make sure I heard the question correctly, there is a certain population that is very energetic about sustainability, getting into that environment, but there also is the other population that may not have um, the same view. How do, how do we tap into that community and, and bring them along as well? I think for Array, uh, we have the advantage of the sustainability piece to attract that population but we're also a technology company, right? What we're doing is uh, really interesting stuff. So I think um, that's going to attract a uh, different population as well. So. Yes, my name is Matthew Nierplex. I am a reporter of the Delphi Journal. Um, you know, there was a lot of talk about partnering with public universities to attract the workforce, but there was also talk about Attracting workforce with just the high school degree, you know, how do you approach that? How do you approach those, you know, those types of people? I didn't quite understand the question. So, so how do you, so there's, there's the workforce that you generate through university. What what is the other category? Yeah, so you know, I guess let me rephrase it. Um, you know, there were, like I said, there were because we're talking about partnering with public universities, different institutions to attract the workforce here in the States. Um, but earlier, there was a mention of attracting the workforce, even with just the high school degree. So, you know, how do you attract those sorts of candidates into this industry? I can take a stab at that. Um, 
and I think this is one area, candidly, where where Array needs to work on is to um, go out into high schools that have trade programs and start to partner with them. Um, again, just an example from earlier this week, I um, had the uh, pleasure of meeting uh, young kid. He was, I think he met in 19 or 20, and was um, our safety manager on site. And I'm like, you know, how do you do that? And he said, listen, I, I tried. I went to college for a semester. And it was boring, I didn't like it, and so I got into the trades. And so if we can figure out how to get into high schools and leverage those types of programs, again, bring them along, right? Invest in them. Um, he had that specific example. There was uh, specific HSD training that he needed to go through, some courses, things like that. He pay for all of that and encourage those types of things. Uh, it's just a matter of making those partnerships and having the resources to go sponsor those types of things. Uh, my name is J.P. Espinoza, and this, this question is for Getty. So you mentioned in your remarks that there is a, there's a, especially at the University of California of Santa Barbara, that many of the graduating students are interested in moving into the, the dot-com business and that we need to attract new entrepreneurs to clean energy. There's such an ease for students to move into the dot-com industry from startup cost to be insignificant that has a high potential to grow. How would you suggest you attract these entrepreneurs from a startup level to move into clean energy? That, that's a terrific question. And, and yes, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, it, there's a reason that the dot-com dot bubble emerge from the big areas because it's not just smart people, we also need finance. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not just enough to have a flammable substance, you need a spark to get things going. And I think that uh, that is such a terrific comment in, in that as, as people from Albuquerque, we, we, need to, we need to be looking out for angel investors, startup funds, I, I think that most often we always feel like, you know, we have a shark tank mentality, right? There is some idea that exists that nobody is thought of that, that does just, you know, next best things and sliced bread and it's going to change the world. And that's the only idea that gets funding. I mean, if you, if you look at array technology, which is, which is a solid product, it, it's, it's used for mounting panels, uh, tracking, and, and you, you might say, you know, there's a lot of IP that goes into something like that, but it's not the type of IP that you have like a Eureka moment. It's sustained research and development. Now you have that in, in Sandia Lab. You have a lot of IP. And, and in a sister field, in additive manufacturing, you have one company after the other starting up in Albuquerque because of that IP. I think the second part of that picture is getting people access to funding. And that's where I think the state can play a role, the city can play a role. Uh, we need to attract investors who are willing to give people a chance to push the product. So I don't know if I offered you a solution, but I wholeheartedly agree with what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, um, I'm trying to understand why the states all around us have so much more solar than we do. And why uh, Santa Fe Community College just closed down their solar technician training program. Um, and why the legislature seems to have $150 million for blue and gray hydrogen, but doesn't seem interested in you know, investing in a proven technology that we need to do if we're going to get to net zero emissions by 2050. Um, it just seems like. <laughs> These are simple solutions that don't need much innovation. We have the technology ready. We need to be investing in this, and yet we can't seem to have the will to do it. Sorry, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I think I heard three questions here. Um, so let me um, uh, tag the first one. Um, there's about 35,000 solar systems installed in New Mexico. And I think it's actually more than that. PM has over 30,000 just on those systems. So there's a fair amount of solar installed here. 
and there's more and more going up. The community solar is going to add uh, another 200 megawatts of solar, and then the utilities have a lot. And there's other projects that I haven't even um, discussed. So there's a lot. So, and I think if you look at it on a per capita basis, we're actually not bad. Now, we should be better because we have the second best solar access in the whole country. So there's a huge opportunity there for us to do more. And by the way, we have lots of land too. So that's also a big thing that we have. And as has been mentioned, we have some great universities, two great institutions. So there's a lot we can do there. Um, I think the second one was the second question um, was a final one was about the hydrogen. And so that's kind of the question I think you have to talk to the developer about. Um, I'm kind of sitting on the sidelines on that. Our organization hasn't taken a position on that. Um, but obviously there's a lot of interest in it. I think part of that is it's, it's people look at it as a way to trans help this transition from a fossil fuel economy that we have, especially going on in the farm to near the you know, the southeast part of the city. And then I think you had another question about the state legislature. Well, that, that was a hydrogen, but Santa Fe Community College, oh. I was doing the other day technician training in solar, and I just like CNN. And then I found something on the workforce development, and then I sent an email to find out about that. No one ever answered me. And that was it. And I know there used to be a lot more programs, so. Are, are we solo technicians? We don't oh, need anymore. Well, <laughs> that, that gets back to that disconnect I was talking about, and I said I don't really have a solution. So I've had some conversations with the college and specifically about their program right when they um, terminated or whatever. And what I was told that it actually there was not sufficient interest in the program to have a standalone program. So they were rolling some of those classes into another program. Um, by the way, they also have a microgrid that, um, it's my understanding, was built almost a year ago. And the last time I talked to them, they still weren't interconnected. So that's a whole other kind of strange issue. Um, but CNN does have uh, a good program. We also have members of our organization from you. And I know you and Adam is doing a lot in that area in New Mexico State. Um, but again, it's kind of a connecting the dots. While we were doing that, we saw our program. I think a lot of it is the lack of utility scale. Do you see the lack of transmission in our state as one of the barriers to increasing solar role? The, the, the one thing that, that we should realize is that solar benefits from scaling. So, so the more you manufacture, the lower the cost becomes, and, and we've been driving costs down. Yeah, we import a lot of our solar, but, but the cost has been dropping steadily. The problem with the grid is you don't have a similar model for, for building grids. And that's where the, the government needs to step in. I think if you don't have grid modernization, you can have lots of modern components, but they don't fit well and they don't play with each other that well. Um, and and so, so I think that it's kind of like similar to the freeway system. You know, you build the freeway system and, and interstate commerce flourish. You build a new grid, and I think that you can you, you then start to perhaps see a lot more solar because then New Mexico can sell its excess energy uh, to Texas to if Texas wants to unisolate itself from the rest of the grid. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all very much, uh, and thank you to the audience for the excellent questions. Please give them a round of applause. much really appreciate that i hope that what you all got from this uh, for me what i got is exactly what we're hoping for which is that we're increasing dot connecting identifying issues that many of us then can go back and take opportunity to continue to work on and address i really want to thank dr sanchez for his presentation that's the kind of work it's a good illustration of the kind of work that we can do at universities but then also follow on i heard great examples of things we need to work on 
from a, an ecosystem development standpoint, an opportunity for continuing to develop workforce and connect the available components that we're already doing on workforce development with those who need it and want it, and to make sure that we are working on public policy, public awareness, uh, and infrastructure investments. And so those are, from our standpoint, this is the goal that we have as Anderson's effort to invest in regional innovation and partnerships that we're working to develop. But also as we continue to develop our center for the future of New Mexico economy, our goal is to continue tackling these issues and, and not just doing research about it, but make sure we're connecting with partners and to move toward outcomes and implementation. So we welcome your suggestions and thoughts as we continue this series and thank you for your engagement today. Uh, I just simply echo the Dean's comment. Thank you all for being, I mean, this is the eyes up here on the stage. I've been watching everybody. You all have really been absorbing this and taking it in and, uh, and hopefully learning uh, just as much as I did. Please give us feedback. Please, if you enjoyed this and you like the topical conversations, tell other people to come to these, these programs in the future. We are absolutely committed to continuing this and doing it on a quarterly basis throughout the year to drive the conversation and Hopefully, most of you are sticking around with us because we have a really awesome lunch. There might be a little bit of an homage to St. Patrick's Day as well. Over there, some, some fun food, a great program. But our panel at the luncheon today is talking about how we are then driving competitiveness through new advisory councils in our organization to then help us drive industry issues forward. So thank you very much. Um, hopefully the panelists will be around. I don't, I don't want to overcommit them, but they'll be around. So if you wanted to introduce yourselves or ask a follow-up question, please do that. And just thanks for being here with us today. <laughs>